this talk, um, Why We're All Just Fish Out of Water. And by no means is that an original title that's been used a lot in describing the evolution of vertebrates, which is kind of what we're going to be talking about today. But when I started thinking a little bit more about this, why we're, or, or um, this idiom of uh, we're all, or being a fish out of water, it didn't kind of quite make sense because the idiom actually describes a person uh, that's in unfamiliar <coughs> or uncomfortable surroundings. And that's not exactly at all what I'm going to be talking about. Rather, I'm going to be talking about the familiarity all the way across the vertebrate tree and vertebrate evolution. And so I should have really titled it something like this, Embrace Your Inner Fish. And again, that's not an original title, and we'll get to, get to that in a little bit. Um, and incidentally, these pictures will show up frequently. This is an awesome fish artist, Ray Troll, so we'll see them around. And so we're going to look at rather the close association of vertebrates and look at this, these shared anatomical structures, their origin, and their evolution across the vertebrate body plan and across vertebrates. And essentially look at the tree of vertebrates and how it's essentially inside of us. So, um, in looking at the highlights of vertebrate evolution, we're going to be talking, try to talk about 500 million years of evolution in less than an hour, which is going to be kind of tough. We're going to attempt to answer a, a few of these questions. And one of the main questions I want to pose to you exactly is like, what exactly is a fish? Okay? You know, we conjure up this mental image of the anatomical structure of what a fish is. But um, it doesn't necessarily work when we start looking at like different points in evolutionary history along the vertebrate tree. So hopefully I'll, uh, I'll come back to this question uh, in the end of this talk. And so then in the end, I also want to come to a bunch of like uh, human characteristics or sort of some of the things that we say that makes humans human and talk about how um, some of these characters are actually consequences of our evolutionary history, whether or not they have lost any sort of um, uh, easily identifiable function or something like that. Ranging from things from hiccups to like goosebumps, hernias, uh, the appendix, and etc. Okay, but before we get started, I wanted to start off with this. And many of you may have seen this if you've taken um, uh, Evolution, Ecology, and Nature of Science, or in other courses, this is a website by NOVA. Essentially, what I'd like you to do is guess this vertebrate <coughs> embryo. So this is an embryo very on, very early on in development. And so these are your choices. A bunch of different vertebrates. Which one do you think it is? That one? Anybody? Dog? What do you think? A bear? <laughs> this one? It's a mouse. So we can quickly look at the mouse development, and you can see how it kind of develops into a mouse. <coughs> right? And then we can go on and look at some of these others. Oops, sorry. Not very good with these mice. No pun intended. All right, what about this one? Let's yell it out. Kangaroo. Kangaroo? <laughs> Anybody else? Right. Yeah. This one's the quail. All right. So got a couple more here. What about this one? This one's got a little clue. It's a little It's got the shell right there, right? Yep. And then we'll look at our last one there. It's kind of a tummy. Anybody? Pig. Pig? No. Nope. It's a bat. <laughs> Okay, so, right? So, why is this so hard, right? Why is this so difficult? Well, it's the fact that the embryos of vertebrates bear striking similarity, especially in early development, because they have history, right? All vertebrates um, evolve from the same common ancestor, and they all use the same toolkit for development, so in the instructions of how and where and when and why different body parts uh, develop where they are. They have this shared developmental program, and this reflects their shared evolutionary history. Okay, so what I've represented here is our current hypothesis of the relationships among the vertebrates. And so this is a phylogenetic tree, and these are all the living things, okay? So, uh, um, and they, they represent between like 50,000 and maybe up to 80,000 species that are living, and this doesn't even include all of the many things that are also extinct. 
And so we're going to be talking about this stuff, about the relationships among these things. Before we get started, though, we need to talk a little bit about what that graphical tree essentially represents. Okay? And so we need to be able to sort of conceptualize the evolution in terms of what this phylogenetic tree means. Okay? And so the phylogenetic tree is a depiction of the inferred relationships among a set of species. Okay? But, um, and so essentially we have a tree here represented by these branches on the tree, right? And they're bifurcating. And, and here we have different species like A, B, C, and D. Okay? And so A is closely related to B and they're united by a common ancestor of this node. But let's zoom in to this branch here and think about what those lines actually represent. Okay. And so this was a really great paper written by Bonham and Hoffner, an American biology teacher, where they do this. And so essentially, if we zoom all the way in, we can start off with a population of plants. And these plants are sexually reproducing, and so they are producing offspring by um, cross-pollinating one another. And so these lines represent where they're cross, where the two parents uh, result in their offspring. Okay. So this represents one generation, the parent generation. And this then represents the offspring generation, okay? And so this also represents time, right? So this is in the past, and then this is either currently or working out into the future, okay? And so we can then expand this group of individuals to all the individuals then that are included in that population, which could be this whole entire row. So all these lines are essentially the glue that connects all these, these parents to their offspring, et cetera, right? And so we move from one generation to the next, so on and so forth. And we can then distill this all down here by taking out all of the organisms and essentially just leaving that glue, which traces the genealogy of this local population of plants, right? Well, then how does this genealogy fit into like, the branches of a tree then, okay? And so essentially, we can think of this population over thousands of generations, and we can include all of the individuals within a population, which is what we represent here in B. Okay, so we have thousands of generations, and this represents at each generation all of the individuals that are within that population. So then at the next level, we can include all the populations that exist within that species, right? And so those get all woven and threaded together with there's occasional interbreeding across these different populations and they're interacting. <coughs> so this then represents all those populations for the entire species over time with the past going towards the present. Okay, and that essentially is what each one of these lines is representing when you zoom down in. Okay. Now, the last thing we need to consider then is what happens when a population becomes genetically isolated meaning that there's no longer this connectivity between these two, but they start diverging on their own pathways, right? So we get a bifurcation in these trees. There's no longer sharing of genetic information. Eventually, over time, these populations diverge enough, and given enough time, they can eventually lead to new species. And so that's when you get the bifurcation of these different, these different nodes within the tree. And it's important also to notice that what exists today, which is down here at the bottom, A, B, C, D, um, includes those living lineages that, that have survived till today. So you can see we have some of these kind of nubs and branches down here. Those are lineages that diverged, but they went extinct, right? They aren't present here today, all right? So that's then, we can flip that back around. So within one of these branches here, we have all that genealogy of the lineages, and then this also represents time. And so this tree diagram that we have here is showing us essentially the relatedness or the recent common ancestry between species. So this point or this node represents the shared common ancestor between these two species, C and D. Now, um, one last thing we need to consider is that uh, a group of organisms that we consider to be a clade or a monophyletic group uh, includes the most recent common ancestor and all of its descendants, okay? So you can see for a point right here at this point on this tree, we have amphibians, primates, and et cetera. This whole group of organisms actually represents the tetrapods, okay? And they're a natural group that have all descended from a single common <coughs> ancestor. And on this tree, we have characters, 
which are essentially these lines that we see all along. <coughs> okay? And so these characters are essentially the empirical data that support this phylogenetic hypothesis, right? So they provide the evidence of common ancestry. And these, these characters are essentially diagnostic features of this group. And so what they mean is that this group, all members of this group, share these characters. These characters are referred to as shared derived characters. So everybody within the tetrapods here has four limbs, right? That's a character that unites that group. Okay? All right, so that's a little bit of tree talk. Now we can get in and start talking about the, the vertebrate phylogeny. But before we even get into vertebrates, we actually need to step down uh, on the phylogeny a bit because there's a pretty there's some important characteristics that show up before we get into the chordates or before we get into the cranes and the chordates um, that we need to talk about a little bit. And so, um, if this is uh, the group that we refer to as the chordata. Okay, and so the chordata consists of the tunicates, which are the sea squirts, and antioxidants, which is the, the lancet. These are both marine filter feeding things. These are both very sedentary organisms, and uh, they don't represent a huge amount of diversity. But uh, Amphioxus is related to the craniates, and the craniates has the vertebrates and all the other stuff down the road, which we'll be getting to in just a minute. Okay? But there's a few important characters that show up, like I said, in the chordates that we need to think about in terms of vertebrates, and that's. And that's shared by all of the chordates, which I'll be representing these with this red bar along here. Okay? But so essentially what we have here is the uh, chordate uh, basic body plan. So all chordates have these characters at some point within their evolutionary development. Okay? So what are these characters that are important? Well, all chordates actually have uh, two holes where they digest their tract. They have a mouth and an anus. That comes a little bit earlier. But just posterior to the mouth, right, anterior is the head, is we have this region here that's called the pharynx, okay, at the beginning part of our digestive tract. And in the pharynx, we have all these slits through it, okay, or these pouches. These are called pharyngeal slits or pharyngeal pouches. And all chordates have these at some point in their development. And at this stage, with an antioxidants and tunicates, these things are used for feeding, for filter feeding. So they allow water to filter out through them, and they get food, and they just through their gut. The next important characteristic we need to think about is the notochord. Okay? The notochord is a flexible rod, and this flexible rod lies just dorsal to, right, to the back of the digestive tract. And it runs anterior to posterior. And this is a flexible rod. Okay? So it can flex this way laterally, but you can't compress it this way. Okay? And then, following that, just to the dorsal part of that, we have the hollow, dorsal hollow nerve cord, which is this thing right along here, which is the nervous system, right? And then the last characteristic is a postanal tail. So we have this segment of uh, the body that extends past the anus, just referred to as the postanal tail, like the name suggests. Well, to go back and look at some of those em embryos, okay, you can actually see these in some of the early stages of development in some uh, vertebrates like the chicken, possum, cat, and human, definitely. So you can see up here, we have the uh, slit beginning of the pharyngeal pouches, and there's also the presence of the post-anal tail. Now later on in development, uh, oh, later on in development, these things um, become other things. So for example, we don't have a lot of time to go into this, this is just tracing uh, where uh, those pharyngeal pouches in humans, what they end up becoming. So they become part of your jaw and part of um, other components of your head. So you can see tracing the nerves and structures of uh, these various gill arches through there. Okay? All right. Now we can start getting into the craniates and, and, uh, and, and the, uh, the vertebrae. So we're right here, kind of at the base of the tree now, and this group is called the craniata, and just like the name suggests, now we're getting a head. This is what we call cephalization, which means all this stuff becomes concentrated at the anterior part of the body, okay? And so in this head, we get a concentration of a bunch of the sense organs. So these are where the eyes are located, we get nose now, we get inner ears, the circular canals are in the inner ear. 
And also part of that is that the brain, we get the three sections of the brain, right? The tripartite brain. We have the forebrain, typically that's the olfactory, right? Sensors, we have the midbrain, that's the eyes. Um, then we get the hindbrain, which is the ears and kind of the rest of the body. And um, um, in addition to that, we also have all the cranial nerves, like the uh, 12 cranial nerves that are, are forming at this point, which we won't get into that hairy mess at this point. So all these complex sex organs, or sense organs, are, are uh, oriented in the head. And then that head um, actually has a case around it. it, has structure to support it and to protect it, and that's the cranium. Okay? And that gets modified as we go along. And the last thing, there's a lot of stuff that happens here. The last thing we need to uh, uh, notice is that these things start getting gills, right? And gills are structures that are used for gas exchange in aquatic environments, right? And so, and also they're supporting elements, which are the gill arches that you see here that extend and hang down from the cranium. And so between each one of these supporting elements, you have the, the filamentous gas exchanging structures here. They're supported by the cartilaginous elements that hold them right there. Okay, so some of the living guys and right now at this point um, are hagfishes. There are not very many hagfishes, like 40 some odd species. Um, it looks like these things have jaws, but they don't have jaws yet. Remember, just those gill arches there. So they have an open mouth, and this is a tongue that sticks out that has teeth-like things on there that they use for rasping. These things are scavengers that are in the bottom of the ocean, and they, they uh, knot their body like this, and they rip the flesh off of, uh, of dead and decaying uh, organisms at the bottom of the ocean. And so they're really well known for sliming up as a way for uh, defending themselves as well. Um, and then uh, if you guys have an eel skin wallet, most likely it's actually a hagfish and not eel skin, so. All right, now we're up to the vertebrates, finally, okay? <laughs> so the vertebrates, obviously, is where we start seeing these uh, supporting structural elements uh, that we consider the backbone, okay? And this is the basic kind of plan of a vertebra. So essentially, down the middle, we have that notochord, right? That flexible rod that can go back and forth, but can't compress this way. And now we have new elements that are now protecting that uh, nervous system, the spinal cord that runs along the dorsal part of the body. And this, we refer to as the neural arch, right? So it goes over the nerve. And then below that, we have the hemal arch, which is another structure that supports the veins and arteries that row that run uh, ventral to that notochord, okay? And this gets highly modified. There's lots of variation throughout the vertebrae. <coughs> this is the basic plan that exists throughout all of them. So here's an example of a fish. So we have in the center here, which is the centrum. Essentially, the notochord gets ossified in this thing. We have the arches, and depending on the part of the body, whether you have a hemo arch or a ridge or something along those lines. And then once you get on, on land, things get really bulky and heavy in order to support these bodies. And of course, that's uh, your achy backbone right there. Okay. And so some of the very early vertebrates who have very rudimentary uh, vertebrae in them are the lamprey. Again, we don't, have, we don't have bone yet. We don't have jaws yet. Okay. So this is just an oral disc mouth opening with these teeth-like things up here. And these guys have a well-developed eye. You can see the gill slits along here. The gill <coughs> respiration. They're found in marine and freshwater environments. But most of them are parasitic. So they have these weird lifespans where they filter feed in streams for like up to like seven or eight years. Suddenly one day they turn and they'll migrate out to some body of water and they'll stick on to a fish. This is like the Great Lakes salmon or something. And uh, they'll attach to them and they won't kill the fish, but they'll suck all the juices out. So that's the lovely lamprey. Okay, now we're finally moving up towards getting some jaws, okay? And so, um, this is the group called Nathos Nomata, which refers to the jaw things. So jaws are, have evolved from the most anterior uh, gill uh, supporting elements, okay? And so here we have kind of a succession of hypothetical about uh, the progression of the evolution of the jaw. So you can see up here, we have the gill elements. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine elements. Some of the most anterior elements get lost, but others get associated with the cranium with various structures. The third one is the red one right here, and that becomes your mandibular arch, or essentially your jaw. And then just posterior to that, 
we have um, this element here, which is a supporting element. You need something to hold those jaws essentially there. And this is the hyoid arch. Okay? And so um, as these elements kind of uh, get derived into different structures, you can see that following post the, the mandibular arch and the hyoid arch, you then have five gill arches and you have five gill slits between these. Okay? And then that one opening that was between these two gill arches is kind of pushed up to this portion and it kind of remains in some of these groups. This is actually the spherical that you find in a shark and we'll see that here in just a second, okay? Which is used for respiration. Well, there's another big thing that happens at this time too and that's where we see the emergence of air fins, okay? So now we have a pectoral fin, we have two of them, right? Those are your arms, and then we have the pelvic fin, and we have the pelvic girdle, and this, those are the supporting elements for, for those posterior fins. And so, there's been lots of work uh, done on, on, on hypothesis of how these things have evolved. Essentially, it's the result, I kind of gave a little bit of an example here. We don't have time to discuss too much about it, but there's a series of genes called Hox genes, and these genes are involved in regulation of development and they get turned on in different parts of your body, right? And so the different, uh, these genes essentially control expression of other genes, okay? And how they're turned on and where they're turned on in different parts of the body can result in different structures arising. And these uh, are, are thought to be the origin of where the carotenes come from. So a shift in sort of this Hox gene expression. I'll leave it at that, it gets much more complicated. But before we kind of move up in there, I thought it'd be a great time to kind of throw in some of these uh, these extinct things because there's kind of a large gap there. We don't have a lot of species in lamprey, and then we move up into sharks. So we have this thing. So then we have sharks and rays up here. Okay. But so there's actually a lot of stuff that happened between here. There are a lot of extinct things, but all these things are soft-bodied, so they don't have a lot of fossils for them. But we do have a lot of fossils of these guys, which, which fall in right here, and they're called placoderms. And these things dominated the seas during the Devonian, we're talking about 400 million years ago. And uh, these had a different kind of bone. They had this like dermal bone, which is associated with the skin. They had this large armor that surrounded the head, essentially. And so um, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of these. And so this isn't really like, the true jaw that comes from that, this is like armor, like wearing a helmet. It's, it's a different origin that this bone comes from than the internal skeleton bone, okay? So, um, but they're super cool and they're super huge and we have a ton of them. And these guys and this guy here and uh, are called Dunkelosteus and they're up to like 10 meters long. They're just gigantic. And of course, we didn't live with them, it's just for scale. <laughs> I think it's pretty funny. All right, so we move up to the sharks and rays. Sharks and rays, right, they're jawed things. We still don't have bone. We have, um, we have jaws, though. There's like 800 living out of these things. We're not going to go into the diversity, but I just wanted to point out that uh, that slit that happens between the hyoid arch, right, and the mandibular arch uh, is what makes the spherical on a shark. And so some sharks can sit down on the bottom and they can pump water through that over their gills so we don't have to be moving around to get uh, water to get a uh, gas exchange um, across our other gills, okay? All right, now we move up to the next group right here. And so these are the osteoides. So now we're getting bone, okay? A particular kind of bone. We get to some kind of calcifications in, in sharks, but it, it works a little bit different. This bone is what we refer to as endochondral bone. And this is bone that replaces cartilage through development, okay, and makes your internal ossified skeleton. Doesn't mean that all of it gets converted, some, some cartilage uh, remains, but most of it gets converted towards this. And so, the other thing that happens is this heavy bony armor that we see a lot. see a lot of placoderms, we no longer see. These elements get converted into other dermal things like scales, uh, feathers, hair, those types of things later up on the tree, okay? And another big thing happens at this point as well. We see lungs slash air bladder. So essentially what happens 
is that this is the esophagus, right? The pharynx would be up over here. Is that along here we get the out pocketing of this? Essentially, it makes a big pocket that extends from here. Okay, and this this structure can be used to assist in the gas exchange. Okay, and so two things kind of happen at this point. So we have this group here, which are like the tissues that you're thinking of tissues, right? And then we have like all the rest of these groups, which are called the lobe fin tissues. We'll get to them in just a second. But the point here is that they both have the out, out pocketing of the esophagus, right, making this structure, but it happens in two different ways. So in this group here, in the fishes, it happens dorsally, right? So if you see right up in here, it happens dorsal to the digestive tract here, okay? It's up here, up here, and there's only one of them. This is like a, a cross section this way, and there's only a single structure in each one of these. So this would be the esophagus, and this is the, the structure above it, dorsally, okay? These group down here, they form ventrally, okay? So they form below it, towards the stomach, and the other thing is they get lobed. There's two of them instead of a single structure. In lower fishes, uh, the connection is remained between <coughs> these things and can actually act as uh, another place for gas exchange to supplement gills, et cetera. But in other fishes, when you kind of move up the fish tree, like, you know, like perch and that kind of stuff, it becomes a swim bladder and it uses its connection with air, and it's used for buoyancy in the water. It still regulates gas exchange, but via a different method, not by gulping air or anything like that, but um, it's used for buoyancy in the water, but these become respiratory organs down here, okay? Cool stuff. Oh, and then I just wanted to point out, down here, if we have things that start uh, breathing air all the time, we start getting a structure that, that blocks this every now and then. It's called a glottis. And so I can shut this off and let stuff go down here without filling up, up your lung with water or food or something like that, right? All right, so ready fin fishes. I wish I could spend the whole time, a time here, but I can't. Uh, there's like more of these guys than the rest of all vertebrates. They're hugely diverse. They, uh, they're considered to be like phenotypically plastic. They do all kinds of crazy things and modifications. Uh, you can just see with some of this diversity here. So this is a tripod fish, a puffer fish. Uh, this is a lipstick bat fish. Just do a lot of swimming, because they're all walking, right? Weird. All these guys have fins that are supported by fin rays. They're bony, but they're of dermal origin from the skin. And if you look at them really closely here, they're segmented. They're derived from scales. So scales are all stacked on top of each other. OK. Say a lot of you will move on. So we'll move now to this group here. So those are the ray fin fishes, most of everything. Now this group here, right? This is what we call, this group is the actinopterygii. This group is the sarcopterygii. And that name just means low fin or fleshy fin um, fishes. And a major thing that happens here um, in this group is that now our paired fins, the structural support changes, okay? And the change is that these base, the, uh, the skeletal support here is what we call a monobasic paired fin. So here we have the girdle, that's the support inside the body that supports the fin. The first element that comes out from there is a single bone, so it's monobasic. So we start getting a pattern where we have uh, these uh, limbs that have one structure, plus two structures, plus many structures, and then some rays out here, okay? If you look at a fish, up in the actinopterygii, that's totally different. Fish have all kinds of bones in there that support these elements. Like, take the olive <coughs> it's crazy learning the bones. There's just like so many of them. And it's just a very different structure, okay? All right, so if we look at the first uh, living representative of this group is the coelacanth. So the coelacanth is a, is a really interesting story um, which we can just briefly chat about here. Um, we thought it was extinct by the 1938 um, uh, Courtney Latimer. She uh, found one of these in a fish market um, in South Africa. She worked at the South African Museum. She was like, whoa, I think that's a coelacanth. And she wrote this guy in Europe. He's like, I think it's a coelacanth. And they came down and found out it was a coelacanth. <laughs> so since then, we know that these things exist. Kind of interesting, you know, that the locals probably knew that it existed because it showed up periodically in the fish market, but it's just nobody had recognized it. It was, a, uh, you know, it was intimate with fish knowledge. So um, the, uh, we now know there's uh, several species of these things, um, and they all occur in the Indian Ocean off of South Africa. And they live in deep water and have really weird life histories and, uh, and et cetera. But the interesting point 
is that they have these low spins. And we'll come back to that here in just a minute. You see, you know, you look online and watch videos of these things swimming, and they just like they look like they're locking. They're just like not like any other fish. It's very bizarre. They also like hang out like this. The next group that's important in our discussion are the lung fishes. Okay. If we go back to the coelacanthus for a sec, they do have that out pocket, you know, the pharynx, right? They do have those two lobes there. They're filled with oil, so they're probably used for some kind of buoyancy. Lungfish, though, they actually use them for respiration, okay? They have two lobes. Um, they have gills. The gills are covered by a structure, um, I don't know, over them, okay? Um, but these guys uh, are actually fish that can drown, which is a crazy idea, right? So some of these guys have to breathe air. They're Basically, three groups of these things. Um, it's an interesting story. They are found, uh, they have a classic like Gondwana distribution, right? So, the breakup of Gondwana was like around 200 million years ago, but these evolved long before that. Um, so, there's a group found in South America, there's a group found in Africa, and there's a group found in Australia. And so, um, the ones in Africa, which is this guy right here, they actually estivate, which means that they dig a hole in the ground and they make a big solid cocoon that's very mucousy inside, and they survive in these little cocoons when the, when the streams dry out. Okay, uh, some of the ones in South Africa and, and Australia don't have to do that, like the, the, the African one does, but they go there and they can breathe air and they can walk across land, which is great. All right, so then now we hit that big. Uh, major event in uh, uh, vertebrate evolution, right? So this is where we see the great transition of vertebrates from water into air. And this group is referred to as the tetrapods, which refers to these guys having four limbs. And the limbs just change. We've had the four structures before, but now they're changing in how they function, right, and what they're doing. And so um, in this transition from water to air, we have very different physical and chemical properties, right? Air differs greatly from water, right? So some of the things like air is less dense than water, right? So now you need to support yourself somehow, right? And so oxygen is also much more abundant in air than it is in water, so you can get your you can do gas exchange a little bit differently. But air is also less thermally stable than water, right? So you start to have to think about like how to insulate yourself and different things like that. So there are multiple hypotheses on why this transition happened, which we won't talk about here, but they just kind of range anywhere from increased competition in the water, you need more areas for reproduction, to land plants are just exploding at this time period, to the fact that there are lots of terrestrial invertebrates at this time period as well. So, um, but the other key thing is just to realize this is not like a sudden thing that happened. It's not like boom, I'm on the water, then I'm on land. It's a gradual event. Probably some organisms were living in muddy waters, right, and kind of venturing on their land a little bit, where others, you know, and then kind of merge more and more until they're spending more and more time on land, okay? So, um, this is another great place to kind of stop and talk about the fossils a little bit. Um, so, essentially, what I've given here is this is a phylogeny, and we have fishes down here, like these guys, uh, right then, and phylogenous fishes who have that. Thin structure, right, with many bones, and we have those uh, bony elements that support those rays that are out here. This is the coelacanth, right? It's monobasic, followed by lots of elemental structures. This is the lungfish here, <coughs> monobasic, followed by many structures here. And then we see a number of different things that are now extinct, okay? I just want to bring this one up because I have these two guys in here to show them in the series. We actually have a really nice fossil. Uh, uh, record on the transition between um, uh, these aquatic fishes to terrestrial amphibians, okay? So down here on the tree, essentially, we have things that are very fish-like. We have lots of fossils of Eusbenopteron and Pandorectes, and you can see they have this skeletal element where they have the monobasic, followed by a pair of bones, followed by many other structures after that, okay? But they still have fins, they still have rays on here. And their body forms still are very much aquatic, right? So these fins are very much probably being used for propulsion in, in, um, in um, aquatic environments, right? But why is this? Well, then up here we have things that are very amphibian like, right? So now we have like two fingers and digits and things. And so we still have fins, though. This is a tail fin, or what's also called a caudal fin. So they're probably aquatic as well, right? They still have some function. In a, um, aquatic environment. 
So um, the reason for this transition is that you know once this movement from the water into the land, you need to be able to move, right? And so you can't paddle yourself on, on land. You need to move yourself, and you also need to be able to support your body, right? You can't just drag it along the ground. You need to get it up off the ground and walk, walk on land, right? And so these are the limbs that support the ability to do this, right? Well, we have this series, right? The campus day goes nice digits, it's very amphibian-like, and then angry bees down here. Um, but very recently, in 2006, um, we discovered, or uh, Shubin and a bunch of his colleagues discovered a fossil which they actually predicted um, that they would find up in northern, uh, northern Canada, which is Tiktaq Rose. Okay? And so this one fit really nicely in this story here. It had elements of it that were very fish-like, but also elements of it that are very um, that are very amphibian-like. Okay, so I'm totally running out of time, so I can't talk too much about this. But I'll just put a big plug in this. If you haven't read this book, it's a really nice, very attainable uh, book to talk about where he talks about this adventure. So essentially, what's happening as well in here, we had this transition between these limbs now being these things have wrists and elbows, and they're able to essentially do push-ups now. Okay, so rather than just uh, flapping or propelling forward. The other important thing that happens in this transition is that you get a separation of your shoulders from your head, okay? You know, a fish cannot do this, right? But amphibians and tetrapods can because there's a separation between the cranium and then the shoulder bones. And then there's also a migration of the eyes. The eyes on fish are, are on the sides and they move up to the, towards the top, okay? So, um, this is a picture of a tectolic that lies somewhere in between these things. So it has these fins that are able to push it up, but it still had fin rays on it, right? And then it had this neck, but it also still has lots of scales. So, um, yeah. And we saw them, so that's kind of cool. <laughs> Put that plug in. <laughs> so uh, the last point I'm going to show us, talk about here, is uh, um, in the movement to land, is that in amphibians, right, which lie right here, so we have tetrapods, which are up here, and in uh, the lower tetrapods are amphibians, and the name amphibia means that they have two modes of life, right? And so essentially, we know the life history of a frog is that they lay eggs in an aquatic environment, right? Those things hatch as larvae, and they have gills, and they live in this aquatic environment, right? Until at some point, they go through a metamorphosis where they, you know, through, um, um, the apoptosis or whatever, they um, get rid of their tail and then they become terrestrial, okay, and that cycle continues. So they have this reliance on water in order for reproduction, okay, but a major event that happens, a character for this group, which is the amniota, is we eliminate that need for uh, an aquatic environment for reproduction, okay, so the amniotic egg offers a stable environment in order for these things to, to develop. You no longer need to lay the eggs in the water, you can lay them on land. And then, of course, you get a whole variety of stuff that happens within those, which we don't have time to chat about, okay? So, um, I'm not going to talk about any of these fuzzy, furry things and these pretty flying things, because, you know, who really cares about that stuff? <laughs> but the last thing I kind of wanted to come back to was to take a look at this phylogeny now and think about a couple of weird characteristics that we have, like, in our bodies, and, and kind of where do they, where they um, what is the origin of these things? Okay, and one of these are hiccups. Okay, so this is a, a, a characteristic of this that's essentially a consequence of our history, right? It's a consequence of two things. The first thing is the consequence of our neurological architecture. Does anybody remember where we got cranial nerves to begin with? They started way back up here. Okay, so cranial nerves <coughs> began up here. And so they went to the various portions of the body, okay? And then the other character that's involved in this is an, another anatomical structure, which is the epiglottis, or the glottis. And that shows up somewhere around here. Remember the outpocketing of the wand and all that stuff to shut it off, okay? So hiccup is essentially a twitch that involves a number of muscles that are, you know, in your body wall, your diaphragm, also your neck and your throat. 
and it results as a spasm of the nerve that essentially controls this breathing. So you kind of get a sharp inspiration of air, and your glottis, your epiglottis shuts, right? And then that, that spasm, that continues. You seldom get one, you always get many. I think on average they last about 60 seconds, and the longest bout of them, I read somewhere, like last, somebody had it from 1922 to 1990, a continuous bout of hiccups. So. That's just kind of horrible. <laughs> so the spasm, right? The spasm begins with the irritation of this nerve. So the nerves that control um, your breathing are part of this uh, regular uh, controlled interval that comes from the base of your brain. And so these nerves have to run a very long way from the base of your neck down to controlling your diaphragm and the other muscles involved in here. And so there's a lot of area where these things can get irritated. For example, irritation can come from overeating, right? Irritation can come from smoking and drinking too much alcohol. And so, um, and that can cause this nerve to spasm. And then the epiglottis, right? Um, so the epiglottis uh, is involved in this abrupt intake of air. And so this uh, behavior, the function of this glottis or the epiglottis originated in uh, tadpoles, and you can see this is a tadpole here. So tadpoles are living in this aquatic environment, right? They have lungs and they have gills, and sometimes they intake a bunch of, of, of air into their lungs when oxygen is low in the water, right? They come to the surface and gulp it in, and they use this glottis that immediately shuts this flap closed, okay? And so it's that abrupt intake of air that, that we can uh, show back in this room. So, the next one, are hernias. And so hernias are really interesting because uh, human gonads, right, we know <coughs> that they descend, right? So early on in development, these things are way up over the heart, and that's exactly where you find them in sharks and rays. The orientation of, of the testes is way up forward in the body. And so as humans develop, we have this great system where they move all the way down, and then they fall into the scrotum. The scrotum's function is temperature control, right? Because sperm are really, really sensitive. And so then, um, but the problem is, is they need to pass through this, this area here, right? And so um, it's called the inguinal canal, and this is a weak spot in our bodies, right? And so it's subject to, to being herniated. And so <coughs> resulting from the descending of the, of the testes. Another consequence of this, right, is that you see that this long tube where the sperm travels down before it gets released, right, the sperm cord. And so here it is in, in humans. As this thing migrates down, right, it, it's still really long, but it gets twisted into this weird pathway, right? And so the pathway that sperm takes to get out the penis is really interesting. It actually goes back up into the waist of the body, back through the pelvic bone, and curves back around before it goes out the penis, which is a consequence of the, of the origin of this, which is um, having the testes located up way by the heart, okay? So I know I'm totally running out of time. What am I doing? But there's uh, vestigial structures, features as well. So these are things that uh, we still have, but they seem to have lost their function. Okay, so for example, goosebumps. Goosebumps are the result of uh, these little muscles called the rectal cilia, which erect here, erect these hairs. And so, um, in in mammals, their function is for thermal to like help uh, keep the body warm, and also used in like uh, response to like adrenaline or fright or whatever to like show and make your body size bigger, right? And that's still how we get them, right? When it's cold, you get the goosebumps, right? But if you don't have any hair, make yourself warmer, or not much, right? It's very fine. And then uh, maybe when you get a big rush of adrenaline, you still get goosebumps as well, although it's not making us look any bigger, right? And uh, the appendix is another one of those awesome things that uh, we have, uh, not really sure what it is, it's kind of a ticking time bomb in our body, right? And so, uh, in herbivorous mammals, this was used for housing bacteria, and those bacteria were used to break down cellulose, which we can't do, right? And so it's this dead-end thing, and it frequently gets clogged, and then that can inflame, and then when it bursts, that's really bad, right? You can die. People don't die that often anymore. It's like a 1% rate of, of an appendicitis. But early on, when in our surgery, it wasn't very good. This was a pretty hazardous thing, right? And we know we can live just as fine without your appendix. Um, as well, my grandfather incidentally had his removed in the battlefield of World War I with no anesthetic. <laughs> and then hemorrhoids. So I need to stop, but I just hopefully I've convinced you that uh, we're actually really Asian. Thanks. <laughs> awesome.